One day, a mysterious gate suddenly appeared on Earth, and similar occurrences were observed all over the world. However, the phenomenon did not cause any physical harm. The reason for this occurrence remains unknown, but the number of civilians expressing anxiety was increasing by the second. Meanwhile, academic personnel were investigating whether this phenomenon had any connection to the monsters that had been appearing in various locations for some time. A similar gate appeared near the area where our protagonist, along with other workers, had nearly finished loading everything. They were about to load the final box of kitchen utensils, intending to take their time since they still had some left. A female worker informed the protagonist, Han Yujin, that they would be taking a break before leaving, but our boy decided to carry the last box up beforehand. Noticing that Yujin was tired, a male worker handed him a water bottle to help him rehydrate. The female worker praises our boy for doing an excellent job, noting how fast he is. The male worker then asks Yujin if he plans to spend all the money he earns from this job on his university fees. Yujin replies that he will use the money to pay for his younger brother's school fees. The female worker is surprised to learn that Yujin is covering his brother's education expenses. Our boy explains that he had to drop out of school and start working because it's just him and his younger brother now, as their parents passed away early. This revelation makes the female worker feel sad for Yujin. However, our boy doesn't mind working for his brother's sake. He then shows the female worker a picture of his younger brother, whom she finds quite good-looking, tall, and attractive. Eugen adds that his brother is taller than him, very kind toward others, and has excelled at everything he's done since he was young. Eugen doesn't stop there and continues to praise the good qualities of his younger brother, which surprises the female worker. Her colleague, however, mentions that Eugen always acts like this whenever they start talking about his brother. Eugen adds that his brother told him he would finish school a little early today, so our boy plans to go with him to eat some meat after finishing his work. Meanwhile, Eugen's brother can be seen sitting on a train, gazing at the gate through the window. The female worker comments that she's happy there's more work lately, even though it's not the typical moving season. It's been quite busy, but she's even happier when Eugen tells her they are getting more work so they can become successful. The male worker explains that the increased workload is likely due to the gates, as more people are moving because they feel uneasy about the phenomenon. He remarks that it would be better if they could understand what the gates really are as they give off an ominous feeling. Our boy mentions that a gate also appeared along the route to his brother's school. The female worker expresses her desire to buy a house, just in case the gates turn out to be a good thing, but her husband reminds her that they don't have enough money for that and should be thankful for the extra work they're getting. Eugen then notices that the color of the gate has changed from black to orange. As they're discussing this, their car suddenly comes to an unexpected stop, surprising them. Eugen decides to step out and check if something is wrong at the back of the vehicle. However, as our boy steps out, he is confronted by a massive monster bird staring directly at him. The bird identifies Eugen as prey and opens its mouth to attack, but Eugen narrowly manages to dodge the strike. Unfortunately, the attack pierces through the car, where the male worker, Eugen's boss, is seated. Our boy is bewildered by the sight of a monster and becomes even more shocked when he sees a horde of monstrous birds emerging from the gate. It turns out that this gate is connected to another world, a dungeon, from which monsters are now pouring into their world. The dungeon had not been subdued, which led to its supersaturation and eventual explosion. This phenomenon, known as a dungeon break, occurs when evil entities flood out due to the explosion. However, this particular dungeon break was unique because it happened simultaneously at all dungeon gates, resulting in what became known as Dungeon Shock. This event caused the deaths of several thousand people, with millions more injured. Amidst the chaos of Dungeon Shock, Eugen tries to save his boss by striking the monster bird with a stick he found nearby. To his shock, the female worker, who is also his boss's wife, stops the monster with her bare hands. Her husband is equally stunned, as her arms appear strange. She quickly tells him not to worry about it, and urges him to escape while he can. The reason for her unusual arms was the result of the dungeon explosion, which awakened certain individuals with the power to fight monsters. These individuals later became known as hunters, specializing in hunting monsters and attacking dungeons. In time, 
hunting became the world's most important profession, and Eugen's younger brother, whom he had cared for so much, awakened as one of the rare few S-rank hunters in the world. The scene then shifts to eight years later, where a hunter is being interviewed. She asks the interviewer if she can see the status window the hunter is trying to display, to which the interviewer replies that she cannot see anything. The hunter explains that the status window is something only visible to the individual, and when she first saw it, she thought she was inside a video game. Within the hunter's status window is a list of skills she can use, one of which is called Turn Our Mountains and Rivers Green a skill that allows her to plant trees within a designated area. To demonstrate, she activates the skill, causing numerous tree branches to sprout around the set, astonishing the interviewer. The interviewer realizes this ability has been used to save many lives. She then informs the audience that Hunter Yumi was job hunting eight years ago during the dungeon shock. The most likely reason Yumi gained the ability to grow tree branches was because she lived in a green, moldy environment. This power recently enabled Yumi to save citizens from a collapsing building. Yumi adds that she acted in such a hurry that she didn't think it through. The interviewer continues, noting that Yumi became a hunter afterward and now makes a living raiding dungeons as part of a small guild. The scene then shifts to a merchant who deals in dungeon materials. He explains that materials from dungeons can be sold for a significant amount of money. Although the work is dangerous, it is far more profitable than other jobs especially when dealing with dungeons ranked A or above, which are essentially treasure troves. He gives the example of a newly discovered material called mana crystal, which didn't exist before the emergence of dungeons. Mana crystals can sell for anywhere from a few thousand to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and because of this, skilled hunters have profited immensely. For S-class hunters who can raid high-tier dungeons, the potential earnings are staggering. In Korea, Han Yohayan is particularly famous for amassing an astronomical amount of wealth by the age of 25, despite awakening as a hunter while still in high school. Despite his humble beginnings and lack of parental support, Han Yohayan founded the Abyss Guild and became the youngest guild master. The interviewer then turns her attention to Yumi, asking if she is wealthy as well. Yumi replies that she is not, as it's unrealistic for an E-class hunter like her. However, she remains hopeful that with continued effort, she will be able to afford her younger sibling's tuition. A few days later, the news reports that Hunter Choi Yumi died during a dungeon raid. She was taken to the hospital early in the morning, but was unable to recover and passed away. As these tragic incidents continue, the public is becoming increasingly aware of the darker side of the industry, despite its allure of high wages. The scene then shifts to a dungeon gate, where a hunter team, the media, and others are gathered. A red-haired hunter quietly calls his boss, questioning why he brought F-class Eugen along. Our boy, Eugen, notices that the red-haired hunter recognizes him. Our boy, Eugen, asks the red-haired hunter to go easy on him, explaining that he needs to enter dungeons to make a living. In an attempt to convince him, Eugen offers to buff him real good. The red-haired hunter replies that he doesn't need the buff and doesn't have a problem with Eugen's lack of ability the issue lies elsewhere. However, their boss interjects, telling the red-haired hunter not to act that way, as there are no hunters as affordable as Eugen. The red-haired hunter retorts that it's obvious Eugen comes cheap, as no one else would want to include a scrub like him. He goes on to add that Eugen has been the sole survivor of multiple party wipeouts, which he finds ominous. He claims this is why Eugen's great younger brother abandoned him, because when Eugen's leg was crushed, his brother never came back. The red-haired hunter then begins searching for the article that was published about the incident. The other hunter standing beside the red-haired one tells him there's no need to bring up Eugen's younger brother and urges him to stop, but the red-haired hunter ignores this and continues reading the article he found. As he starts, our boy grabs him by the collar and demands that he stop, insisting that these are entirely separate matters. The red-haired hunter, initially startled, quickly retaliates by hitting Eugen. He lifts Eugen by the collar and taunts him, asking if Eugen can feel the difference in their strength. He questions why an F-class hunter like Eugen would dare pick a fight with a D-class. Afterward, the red-haired hunter throws our boy to the ground and sneers, telling him to go complain to his amazing younger brother, if he feels so hurt. The other hunter remarks that Eugen always reacts like this whenever his younger brother is mentioned, and the two walk away. Eugen's boss then finds him in a disheveled state, 
and advises him to stop getting hurt before even entering the dungeon. As he says this, he strengthens Eugen's bones, which is his specialty. Eugen's boss tells him that while he might not be able to fully heal our boy's legs, he can make movement easier for a few hours. Moreover, he advises Eugen not to dwell too much on what the red-haired hunter said, as it cannot be helped. Eugen's boss further adds that since Eugen is an F-class hunter who is being supported, he should be the one to hold back. Our boy agrees, acting rather enthusiastically, and expresses his gratitude to his boss for allowing an F-class like him to tag along. Eugen also acknowledges the difficulty his boss faces in mediating between him and the red-haired hunter and requests that his boss give his all, just as usual. However, Eugen's boss is taken aback by the sudden change in our boy's demeanor. Completely oblivious to the fact that Eugen has used his power on him, he thanks our boy for being the only one who recognizes his efforts. Eugen's boss then walks away and confronts the red-haired hunter for bullying Eugen. The guildmaster, Lim Sikor, tells the red-haired hunter that he does not realize how valuable and knowledgeable Eugen is about the dungeons. The red-haired hunter is taken aback by the sudden change in his boss's demeanor, while our boy ensures that his boss has been added to the list of influence targets. As Eugen walks into the dungeon, he reflects on how words like scrub, ominous, are not inaccurate descriptions of them, as he has managed to survive all thanks to this skill. After they enter the dungeon, Everyone except for the F-class Eugen begins fighting the monsters. Sikwu warns them not to let their guard down, as they cannot predict where monsters might appear. However, the red-haired hunter dismisses this concern, stating that they have been in this D-rank dungeon numerous times, and that any monster that emerges will not be strong. As Sikwu holds a large crystal obtained from killing a monster, he reminisces about how they used to tremble in fear during the dungeon shock at the sight of monsters like these, unaware at the time that these creatures would ultimately bring them financial gain. The red-haired hunter is surprised by the size of the crystal, estimating that it could be worth several thousand dollars, even as just a D-class mana crystal. He turns to Eugen to ensure he is mining properly, as 80% of what Eugen mines will be paid as commission. Our boy feels disheartened to realize that he will be compensated very little. The red-haired hunter encourages him explaining that the items dropped by the monsters belong to the hunters, so Eugen should mine as much as he can if he does not want to starve. Moreover, the red-haired hunter warns Eugen that if they catch him trying to steal any of the crystals he has mined, they will not let it slide and will teach him a lesson. This threat makes Eugen angry, prompting him to start singing to lighten his mood. He sings that he is essentially a Cinderella who lost her parents at a young age. Similarly, our boy also lost his parents and became estranged from his brother, who left home after awakening his powers, claiming it was too dangerous to stay. During the time Eugen was conscripted into the military, his brother gathered hunters and established the Abyss Guild. After his guild became the strongest in the country, Eugen's brother transformed into someone nearly unreachable, leaving our boy alone. Desperate for his own awakening, Eugen sought out a broker who promised they could help him awaken if he quit his job and handed over all his savings. Without proper consideration, our boy signed a contract after the broker coaxed him, assuring him they would support him since he was the older brother of an S-class hunter. So, our boy engaged in all kinds of shameful activities and finally awakened. However, he was classified as an F-class hunter, despite being the older brother of an S-class hunter. As a result, the public began shaming him, accusing him of begging to be accepted into the Abyss Guild. His brokers demanded compensation, stating that they sponsored him under the premise that Eugen was the older brother of the Abyss Guild master. Our boy faced severe criticism from the media, all while burdened by his debts. His younger brother was ashamed of him, questioning how long he would have to take care of someone like Eugen. One of the bystanders remarked to Eugen's younger brother that the title Eugen earned upon awakening was caregiver, since he was someone who raised an S-class hunter. However, Eugen's younger brother countered that rather than being a caregiver, his brother was merely holding him back. Unfortunately, the reign of misfortune over Eugen did not end there. He became unable to use his legs after injuring them in the dungeon, and his brother refused to provide healing support to someone like Eugen. Rather, Eugen's brother views this as a positive development, believing that Eugen will no longer act out to enter the dungeon. He leaves Eugen with a request to live quietly and stop holding him back. 
our boy snaps out of his thoughts and concludes that his brother is justified in his actions. He feels worthless, as he is an incompetent older brother to a successful S-class hunter who tried to exploit his younger brother like a parasite. As the reason an F-class hunter like him has survived in dungeons, where people perish daily, is due to a specific skill that benefits others. Eugen's skill, caregiver, allows him to influence his surroundings. When he utters his keyword, cheer up, to those who are as close to him as family or to strangers he has befriended, they become influenced, receiving a slight buff to their growth. This is the fundamental ability of a caregiver. However, there is no way that Eugen could survive in this field with such a skill, as support from a mere F rank is not substantial. However, Eugen did not survive due to luck or because he stayed in the back. Rather, he survived because of another aspect of the caregiver skill. It is this skill that has saved Eugen every time he faced danger, allowing him to endure even when the rest of the team did not. As our boy contemplates this, he suddenly receives a status message indicating that the caregiver's effect is being activated, along with the additional skill, Last Reward. This activation causes the skills and stats of the influenced user to be transferred at twice their strength. Our boy is surprised and realizes that the power of his boss is flowing into him, which does not make sense since there cannot be a life-threatening situation in a D-class dungeon. Eugen's panic arises from his hidden skill, Last Reward, which enables him to temporarily utilize the skills of the target of his influence with twice their strength. This means that if the target speed is 100, our boy can run at 200, and if they possess great strength, our boy becomes capable of fighting with twice their power. It is thanks to this skill that Eugen has always survived. However, it is a skill that carries ominous implications because the condition for its activation is the death of the influence target. Upon reaching the location where the party was raiding, Eugen is shocked to discover that his boss, Sequor, has died. Hearing a scream, he turns his head and is stunned once again. Our boy realizes that the monster before him is none other than La Cheetahs, the Dragon King of Poison, a first-class dragon deemed impossible to eradicate, as no one has succeeded in defeating it thus far. This leaves our boy wondering why such a formidable creature is in a D-class dungeon. Eugen is astonished to encounter a first-class dragon like La Cheetahs. In response, he activates the skill Enhance Legs, a D-class bone enhancement skill of his boss that temporarily heals his broken legs. Due to the caregiver's hidden skill, Eugen receives twice the effect of this enhancement. With his healed legs, our boy decides to run as fast as he can to reach a location where La Cheetahs cannot follow and hide there while searching for a way to escape. Eugen's eyes land on a small door, and he resolves to hide there. However, La Cheetahs proves to be intelligent, attacking the only escape route Eugen had in mind, and then proceeding to strike at him. In an attempt to block the attack, Eugen strengthens his arms, but he is unable to defend himself as La Cheetahs sends him flying to the ground, barely managing to survive the heavy blow from La Cheetahs, which makes our boy realize that he is no match for the dragon, even with the enhanced strength provided by his boss's skill. As Eugen contemplates this, the memories of Eugen's boss before his demise flood into him, and our boy realizes how powerless his boss was in front of La Cheetahs, despite the healing. As the temporary effect of Eugen's skill wears off, he finds himself unable to flee and wonders if this is how his worthless life will end. La Cheetahs opens its mouth to engulf Eugen, but he is struck by a powerful fire blast from Han Yohayan, who has just arrived to save his brother. Our boy is astonished to see his younger brother, who never cared for him after becoming an S-rank hunter, come into a D-rank dungeon to rescue him. Yuhayan instructs Eugen to stay back, but Eugen remains concerned for his brother and warns him that even he would not be able to face the three heads of La Cheetahs alone. However, Yuhayan ignores Eugen's warning and activates his skill, Blue Willow Leaves, which enables him to move through the air to get closer to La Cheetahs so he can take the monster down. La Cheetahs is struck directly by the attack of an S-rank hunter. However, Yuhayan does not stop at piercing the monster. He also activates his dark flames, causing La Cheetahs to scream in agony. Our boy is surprised by his brother's speed and is in awe of how S-rank hunters fight. However, La Cheetahs does not relent and releases a poisonous attack from its other head directed at Yuhayan, which, according to Yujin, is a deadly poison that even a potion cannot cure. 
Yuhayan activates a giant shield to defend himself against La Cheetah's attack, but some of the drops still land on him. Undeterred, Yuhayan attempts to strike La Cheetah's again, only to realize that his sword has been melted by the deadly poison. Our boy wonders if the reason his brother cannot fight freely is that he is protecting him, prompting him to shout at Yuhayan to say something. Yuhayan questions our boy about why he is in a dungeon again and how long Yujin expects him to clean up after his mess, despite the fact that Yujin's shattered leg should have served as a wake-up call to keep him out of dungeons. Yuhayan mentions that he has told Yujin many times to stop acting out and to live his life quietly. However, our boy asks if Yuhayan came here because he is worried that Yujin will end up grabbing his ankles again. Yuhayan tells him to stop talking and hide in the corner. On the other hand, Yujin thinks it foolish to expect that Yuhayan would come to rescue him just because they are brothers. He knows there is no way it could be like that, given how foolish and selfish he is. Our boy understands that it must be difficult for his brother to see him acting out and not knowing his place, which makes him curious about why Yuhayan came here, as there is a much simpler way to address this problem. Yujin takes a blade out of his inventory and runs to attack Lachita's, surprising his brother, who had told him not to get involved in the fight. However, our boy ignores Yuhayan and pierces the foot of La Cheetahs while the monster is engaged with his brother. Yujin then proposes a solution to Yuhayan's problems, suggesting that he leave Yujin to die here. He explains that even if Yuhayan saves him, Yujin will inevitably end up grabbing Yuhayan's ankles again. Moreover, Yuhayan would not have to deal with the inconvenience of a funeral if Yujin dies in a dungeon. Our boy tells Yuhayan that this will not only resolve Yuhayan's issues, but will also bring happiness to everyone in the abyss, so Yuhayan should not worry about Yujin anymore. Meanwhile, the La Cheetahs notices our boy and attempts to chew the life out of him, but Yuhayan activates his black fire to stop the La Cheetahs while simultaneously saving our boy. However, despite Yuhayan's success in rescuing Yujin, he is unable to evade the La Cheetahs' attack and sustains a fatal injury prompting Yujin to wonder where their lives took a wrong turn. They were unlike any other brothers, especially after their parents passed away, always taking good care of each other as if it were just the two of them in this world. Now, however, our boy asks Yuhayan why he is doing this, but Yuhayan does not answer. Instead, he instructs Yujin to listen carefully to what he is about to say. Yuhayan, panting heavily, explains that La Cheetahs falls asleep every five hours, so if Yujin can hide for just another hour, the La Cheetahs will fall asleep. He urges Yujin to seize that opportunity to escape. Yet, Yujin cannot comprehend why his younger brother, who has never cared for him, is sacrificing his life for him, an F rank. Yuhayan did not even visit Yujin once in the hospital when Yujin broke his leg, and he had pushed Yujin away when he begged for help, telling him not to cause any trouble. Our boy is bewildered by why his younger brother, who has always neglected him, is smiling in a situation like this. Not only does Yuhayan sacrifice himself, but he also gives Yujin a gate stone that can be used to escape the dungeon. Our boy insists that Yuhayan should be the one to use the gate stone and that they need to address his wounds first. However, Yuhayan tells our boy that it would be of no use to him because he would not be able to activate the gate stone. After saying this, Yuhayan takes his last breath in Yujin's arms, triggering the hidden effect, last reward, from the skill caregiver, which transfers Yuhayan's abilities and skills to Yujin with twice the effect. As the La Cheetahs attempts to stomp on Yujin, our boy does not waste a single moment. He activates Blue Willow Leaves to swiftly evade the attack. Yujin considers Yuhayan foolish for sacrificing himself for him, but thanks to this sacrifice, he feels newfound power coursing through his body. Our boy then takes out the sword Yuhayan was using and prepares to fight the La Cheetahs who seems determined to see this through to the end. With resolve, Yujin takes a huge leap and pierces the head of the La Cheetahs, taunting the creature for being too slow to catch him. Now, our boy is twice as strong as his brother. The memories of Yuhayan flood into Yujin's mind, revealing how Yuhayan did everything he could to prevent Yujin from getting involved in his life, as Yujin is an F-ranker. Yuhayan believed that Yujin would become his weakness due to his powerlessness, making him a target for Yuhayan's enemies. Consequently, Yuhayan felt compelled to take drastic measures to protect his brother, even if it meant jeopardizing their relationship. Our boy dashes forward to strike at the head of the La Cheetahs while absorbing more of Yuhayan's memories. 
He learns that Yahayan did not want him to become a hunter, as the law does not adequately protect hunters, and Yohayan regrets not being able to prevent the brokers from awakening his brother. After our boy successfully kills the Lachitas, another memory washes over him, revealing that Yohayan refrained from providing him with a healer because he wanted to keep Yujin from entering another dungeon. Yohayan had even instructed his employees to expel Yujin while continuing to provide financial support, all the while ensuring it appeared as though he was doing so solely because Yujin is his brother. Yohayan desperately wishes that his brother does not enter another dungeon. Meanwhile, our boy stands atop the corpse of the La Cheetahs, expressing his frustration to his deceased brother for not revealing the challenges he faced. Eugen blames himself for ignoring Yohayan's words and continually obstructing his brother's efforts, simply because he was unaware of Yohayan's true intentions all along. As Eugen's skill, last reward, nears its end, he realizes that he will succumb to La Cheetah's poison gas once the timer expires. He prepares himself to accept death, feeling there is no reason for him to continue living. However, just as our boy contemplates this fate, a message appears, stating that he has achieved an impossible feat by slaying a dragon on his own. Consequently, he receives the legendary title of Dragon Slayer, along with rewards of 10 gate stones, 5 rank 1 granting essences, the Crimson Dragon Greatsword, and a Wishing Stone that grants one wish. Eugen is thrilled to learn that this stone can grant a wish, and without wasting a moment. Our boy wishes for his brother's revival, but the stone quickly informs him that it is unable to fulfill that wish. This prompts Eugen to question the types of wishes the stone can grant. He contemplates that if the stone can grant any wish, it may be possible for him to become even stronger than Yuhayan. This would mean that Eugen could rise to become the strongest hunter, a new hero who would enjoy a level of honor far greater than anything he has envied for so long. However, our boy is fully aware of the mistakes he made in this life and intends to avoid repeating them if given another chance. Thus, he requests time to reverse and return to the period when his brother Yohayan was still alive. Our boy pledges to live a peaceful life, free from the dangers of dungeons, and elaborates on his request by asking the stone to rewind time to the moment before he became awakened. The stone acknowledges Eugen's desire to turn back time, to which Eugen accepts, recognizing that even if he regrets his previous decisions, he would at least ensure that nothing like this happens again. Afterward, the stone emits a very bright light, and our boy wakes up on a sofa. Eugen begins to look around, trying to ascertain his location, and realizes that he is in Yohayan's guild building. This confirms that he has indeed traveled back in time, as he cannot see his status window either. Our boy checks his phone and discovers that he has traveled five years into the past. However, what he cannot comprehend is why he is in Yohayan's building specifically. Eugen recalls a disheartening memory. It was the day he visited the awakening broker with a substantial sum of money, believing he could become like his brother if he awakened, unaware that it was a scam. Subsequently, he was dragged to this location. Our boy realizes that if it is indeed the same day he went to the broker, his younger brother Yohayan would soon enter the room. Just as Eugen anticipated, Yohayan enters, telling Eugen that he had warned him many times to avoid any actions that would lead him here. Upon seeing Yohayan, our boy is assured that he has truly traveled back in time. So, he quickly rushes forward to hug Yohayan, feeling relieved that Yohayan is alive. However, Yohayan, on the other hand, is surprised by his brother's behavior. Eugen does not waste any time and apologizes to Yohayan for everything, acknowledging that he was immature. Yohayan, sensing something suspicious, asks Eugen if he has caused even more trouble. Our boy assures Yohayan that this is not what he is thinking. Rather, Eugen reflects on his way here that, despite Yohayan being very young, he must have faced many challenges alone while managing the guild and the dungeons. As his older brother, Eugen realizes he should have been more aware of what Yohayan was enduring. He assures Yohayan that he does not have to worry about him anymore, promising not to cause any further trouble. Yohayan is happy to hear that his older brother will refrain from causing more issues, and he thanks Eugen for expressing this. Although our boy finds it embarrassing to share such sentiments with Yohayan, he is genuinely relieved that he can still prevent that incident from occurring, as they are brothers unlike any other. Our boy tells Yohayan that he loves him and vows to forget everything about hunters, 
deciding to live his life quietly as he should have. However, Eugen is suddenly shocked when he hears a status message indicating that he has been registered as an Awakener. The system does not stop there. It begins providing him with various titles, such as Dragon Slayer and Perfect Nurturer. Along with the activation of the additional skill, My Kid is the Best, which increases Yohayan's growth speed by 100%. Yohayan starts preparing food for Eugen, assuring him that it won't take long and advising him to relax. However, Eugen finds the situation awkward, as before he turned back time, they had fought on this day, and our boy had run away again. While he's glad that they reconciled, Eugen hadn't anticipated having dinner together. What surprises him the most is his awakening, which feels different from before, especially as he wonders about the title he received. Our boy discovers he has earned the title Dragon Slayer, L, a distinction for Solo slaying a first-class dragon. This makes him curious whether it's because he killed La Cheetahs, a feat Eugen assumed would be disregarded due to the time reversal. He finds it odd and speculates that the L rank might stand for Legend, potentially ranking even higher than S. To his amazement, the title also comes with four additional skills. Eugen has also gained L rank resistance to fear, poison, and curses, leaving him to wonder if this will make him completely immune to anything below L rank. Moreover, he also gained an SS rank skill, which doubles the effectiveness of all his abilities against dragon-type enemies. This makes him wonder if, after returning, he has become the world's strongest. Our boy imagines himself in a dungeon, engaged in a fierce battle against La Cheetahs with his squad. When La Cheetahs launches a poisonous attack, everyone retreats, knowing the poison could be fatal. However, Eugen steps in front of his brother in a dramatic fashion to save him, confidently stating that the poison has no effect on him because, to a real hunter, it's merely a refreshing shower. Our boy envisions his brother and the rest of the squad finding him incredibly cool, and he begins to wonder whether he has awakened as an S-rank or even the world's first L-rank. However, his grand vision comes crashing down when he realizes his stats are still those of an F-rank, leaving him frustrated because, despite having these powerful skills, he wouldn't be able to use them. He also notices that his dexterity and mentality stats have been buffed to E-rank, similar to the skills he had before. He also discovers that his skill, Caregiver, has been upgraded to L-rank, which now comes with four additional skills. Eugen notices one called Last Reward, but decides it's best not to use it. Instead, he focuses on other skills like My Kid is the Best, a legendary skill that boosts the growth rate of a subject influenced by a keyword for three days making it similar to the previous caregiver skill. Our boy is shocked to learn that the growth rate is now twice as fast, leading him to wonder if Yuhayan will become stronger at twice the rate of other hunters. Eugen then considers combining it with My Kid is So Great, an SS rank skill that increases the stats and abilities of the subject by a percentage, depending on the number of intelligent beings present, with a maximum boost of 100%. This skill activates once Eugen cheers for the subject using a keyword in front of at least five intelligent beings. This means that if he cheers for Yahayan in front of 50 people, and even more so in front of 100 people, with the plus 100% boost, Yahayan will become twice as strong. Our boy thinks that, at this rate, it's only a matter of time before he makes his brother Yahayan the greatest. Not only Yahayan, but all the hunters in the abyss would benefit from these skills making the Abyss Guild the greatest in the world within a few years. The nurturer of this success would be none other than Eugen, allowing him to live a life of splendor. However, all of Eugen's dreams come crashing down, and he begins hitting his head on the table when he realizes that the keyword to activate the skill is, I love you. Our boy thinks he must have changed this keyword when he awakened. Eugen understands that if he were to run around saying this to everyone, from elders to young people, rather than spreading influence, he would likely end up getting arrested. This leads him to conclude that while the skill itself is amazing, the awkward keyword renders it almost useless. Our boy then examines the last skill in his repertoire, Promising Sprout, which allows Eugen to assess an unawakened individual's expected awakening rank. Furthermore, anyone influenced by his keywords would awaken with their optimal potential. As Eugen contemplates the practical applications of these skills, his brother Yohayan places a bowl of rice in front of him, asking if it would be enough for our boy to eat. To this, our boy replies that it will be more than enough. 
Yuhayan admits he's unsure how it will taste, as he made it with whatever ingredients he had on hand. However, Yujin finds it delicious, which makes Yuhayan happy. He tells Yujin that there is more, so if Yujin wants seconds, he should just ask. Our boy expresses his surprise, saying he didn't know his brother was good at cooking. Yuhayan replies that his cooking skills improved out of necessity while he was trying to survive, which surprises Yujin. Curious, Yujin asks why Yuhayan had to cook for himself when he seemingly had everything. Yuhayan explains that it was safer to make his own food because there was always a risk of someone poisoning it. This revelation shocks our boy, who then asks Yuhayan if there were people who actually cursed or poisoned his food. Yuhayan responds that, back then, he was a reckless kid running around alone, and as a result, others tried to put him in his place. However, he is sure things would have been better had he joined an average guild. Our boy shouts at Yuhayan upset that his brother never mentioned any of this to him before. But Yuhayan calmly replies that it was the outcome of his own choices. What truly bothers Yuhayan is that, due to his harsh actions, his relationship with his brother worsened. He constantly monitored and interfered with Yujin to ensure his enemies wouldn't discover him. Moreover, Yuhayan deliberately avoided his only brother, Yujin, to prevent his enemies from learning about his existence. Yujin tells Yuhayan that he should have just confided in him, but Yuhayan admits that he didn't want to burden Yujin and assumed, over time, Yujin would no longer care. However, he was wrong, as his older brother still worries about him. Yuhayan apologizes to Yujin for his selfish behavior and tells our boy that he loves him. He also expresses gratitude for Yujin's kindness and understanding, even when Yuhayan was so stubborn. Touched, Yujin starts feeding Yuhayan out of love and reflects that turning back time was the best decision of his life, which fills him with happiness. Yuhayan then decides to leave, mentioning that he has things to take care of. However, before he goes, he tells Yujin to delete the contact information for the Awakening Brother, explaining that even if Yujin tries to call them, it won't matter. Yuhayan assures Yujin that he will make sure the brokers can no longer pick up, which makes our boy wonder if Yuhayan plans to beat them all to a pulp. Yuhayan then watches intently as Yujin deletes the broker's contact from his phone. Once Yuhayan is satisfied that the number is gone, he heads out to take care of some work. Meanwhile, our boy mentions that he'll leave after tidying up the place. However, Yuhayan stops him and asks where he's planning to go, reminding Yujin that he's no longer allowed to go anywhere since he'll be living here from now on. This leaves Yujin in complete shock. Our boy can't believe what Yuhayan means when he says that Yujin cannot leave. Yuhayan explains that it's too dangerous outside, which shocks our boy even more, as he still doesn't understand why his brother is acting this way. Yujin tells Yuhayan that he managed just fine this morning, but Yuhayan insists that things have changed. Now that Yujin is once again close to him, he is no longer as safe as he was before. Yuhayan further explains that Yujin was only safe because Yuhayan had cut off their relationship. But now that they've reconciled, Yuhayan's enemies will see Yujin as a weakness and a target to exploit, meaning Yujin's life could be in danger at any moment. Because of this, Yuhayan forbids Yujin from going anywhere and insists that he live with him in the house from now on. Our boy thinks Yuhayan is acting crazy and makes a run for the door to leave. However, before he can escape, steel bars suddenly appear in front of Yujin, blocking his path. Yujin is completely stopped from leaving the premises of the building surprised by his brother's obsessiveness. He's startled when a delivery man suddenly asks if he is Yujin, informing him that they've finished moving all of his belongings as requested, and asks him to sign the paperwork. Yujin is shocked to see all his possessions in front of him, and Yuhayan explains that nothing is left at Yujin's old house because this is now his new home. Our boy, stunned, tells Yuhayan that he's insane for doing this. However, Yuhayan doesn't understand why Yujin thinks he's crazy. He reminds Yujin that he said it was fine when Yuhayan apologized and expressed his love. Moreover, Yujin had accepted everything Yuhayan did for him, which, in Yuhayan's mind, was essentially giving him permission to bring Yujin's belongings to his home. Our boy is baffled, wondering how any of that implied he was giving Yuhayan permission to move all his things. After this, Yuhayan orders Yujin not to take a single step outside the house. A depressed Yujin lies down, trying to figure out the reason behind Yuhayan's strange behavior, suspecting it might be a side effect of the time reversal. However, 
Our boy soon realizes this is not the time to be lying around. He decides to grab what he needs from his belongings and make a run for it before Yuhayan returns, fearing he might be confined forever if he doesn't act quickly. As Yujin opens the door to sneak out of Yuhayan's house, he is startled to see Kim Songhan, an A-rank hunter from the Abyss Guild, standing guard outside. Songhan, one of Yuhayan's closest confidants, possesses a powerful defensive skill. Nervously, Yujin greets Songhan and asks him to step aside, but Songhan refuses, explaining that the guild leader, Yuhayan, has specifically ordered him to ensure Yujin does not leave the house. This surprises Yujin, who didn't expect his maniacal brother to assign an A-rank guard to prevent his escape. Our boy demands Songhan move aside, claiming he's just going for a short walk. However, Songhan again refuses, calmly stating that Yujin is not permitted to leave. Frustrated, Yujin asks why Songhan cares where he's going. Seeing that Yujin isn't complying, Songhan grabs his shoulder and warns him that he won't repeat himself. He firmly tells Yujin to return to his room, and if Yujin refuses, Songhan will throw him inside, even if it means using force. Our boy feels the intense pressure Songhan is emitting, making it seem as though his whole body is being crushed. Yujin likens the experience to a herbivore standing in front of a predator, recognizing the distinct aura that high-ranking hunters exude. Despite this, Yujin tells himself not to be afraid and soon realizes that his fear-resistance skill has activated, nullifying the pressure. Our boy realized that as he's not even trembling anymore, thanks to the skill. In fact, Kim Songhan now appears like a cute, docile dog in Yujin's eyes. Emboldened, Yujin, like a rabbit daring to stand up to a bear, demands that Songhan let go, asking what he thinks he's trying to do. Our boy threatens to call the police on Songhan if he doesn't let go, but Songhan is unfazed. Instead, he grabs Yujin by the collar, warning him that he's practically asking for a beating. Songhan then asks if Yujin would prefer to be physically thrown back into his room. Realizing the situation, Yujin apologizes and says he's sorry for his behavior, while internally questioning the point of having a fear resistance skill if he still can't take action. As Songhan opens the room door and tells Yujin to go inside, Yujin tries to buy time, asking Songhan to wait a moment. Desperately, Yujin searches for a skill that might help, and just then, his promising sprout skill activates. To Yujin's surprise, he discovers something unexpected about Songhan. Without thinking, Yujin suddenly grabs Songhan's face, leaving him startled and confused, unable to figure out what Yujin is trying to do. Meanwhile, Yujin realizes that Songhan has the potential to become an S-rank hunter, meaning there could be two S-rank hunters within the Abyss Guild. Although amazed by this revelation, our boy feels disappointed that he can't change Songhan's rank using his skills. Suddenly, a system message appears, notifying Yujin that Songhan is not yet influenced. However, it also reveals that once Yujin successfully influences him with the right keywords, Songhan can obtain the S-rank skill he previously failed to acquire, all thanks to Yujin's skill. My kid is the best. Our boy is thrilled to learn that he can change Songhan's skill by influencing him, especially since Songhan will comply with anything Yujin says once influenced. Yujin quickly formulates a plan to regain his freedom by unlocking Songhan's S-rank potential. However, Yujin suddenly remembers that the activation keyword has changed, and now he has to tell Songhan, I love you. Embarrassed, our boy stutters while attempting to say the words, realizing he can't bring himself to say it directly. He decides to take a more symbolic approach. Confused, Songhan asks what Yujin is trying to do. Yujin responds by telling Songhan to pay attention and then starts making heart symbols with his hands. Songhan, visibly disgusted, tells Yujin to stop doing such ridiculous and embarrassing acts insisting that it doesn't suit him and ordering Yujin to quietly return to his room. Meanwhile, Yujin, frustrated, mentally begs the system to change his activation keywords. Yuhayan returns home late at night and asks Yujin if he rested well, while Yujin, on the other hand, looks as though the life has been drained out of him. Our boy sarcastically asks if Yuhayan can't see that he's practically dying from being cooped up all day. Yuhayan, however, notices that Yujin hasn't unpacked his belongings yet, interpreting it as a sign that Yujin prefers living with him over staying in his old place. Pleased with this assumption, Yohayan promises to give Yujin an unused room. 
Yu Haiyan suggests they move all of Yujin's things to the new room, but Yujin, too exhausted to care, tells him to do whatever he wants because he feels like a prisoner in the house. Sensing his brother's discouragement, Yu Haiyan tries to lift Yujin's spirits, reassuring him that he'll be allowed to go outside soon. Just hearing this breathes life back into Yujin and our boy. Suddenly more alert, eagerly asks when he'll be able to leave. However, Yohayan urges Yujin to listen carefully. He explains that there are still many enemies who are wary of the Abyss Guild, but once they grow stronger, no one will be able to act recklessly against them. Yohayan explains that once the Abyss Guild becomes the strongest in the nation, Yujin will be free to leave. However, our boy isn't pleased with this plan, knowing it took several years in the future for that to happen. Yohayan, sensing Yujin's frustration, tries to reassure him, saying that Yujin only needs to endure for one year, as he plans to eliminate the competition within that time. But Yujin knows it actually took more than three years, though he's unable to reveal this to Yuhayan. Yuhayan continues, promising Yujin that he'll be allowed out occasionally, but either Songhan or Yuhayan will always accompany him. Yuhayan adds that since dungeon clearings take several days, they can't let Yujin go out too often, and Yuhayan refuses to trust B-rank or lower hunters with his brother's safety. As Yujin, now deep in despair, contemplates his situation, he wonders if there's something he can do with his skill. One thought crosses his mind. In his previous life, Yujin, Yujin spent most of his previous life gathering information about hunters, so he knows exactly which individuals will rise to high-ranking positions. His plan is simple. Find these hunters, awaken them, and make them sign contracts to serve as his escorts in exchange for their awakening. If Yujin can build his own force this way, Yohayan would have no grounds to object, which means Yujin could regain his freedom. It's a strategy that seems entirely possible given Yujin's skills and titles. After thinking deeply about it, Yujin proposes to Yohayan that he will personally find an A-rank hunter to serve as his guard. Our boy sets out to find a young easily persuadable hunter with the potential to become A or even S rank. His goal is to raise this individual as his exclusive hunter, fully aligned with his ambitions and loyal to him. Yuhayan is taken aback when Yujin declares that he will find an A rank hunter, and Yujin proposes that if he successfully brings in his own personal A rank guard, Yuhayan should allow him more freedom to move around. Intrigued, Yuhayan asks how Yujin plans to find such high ranking hunters. Our boy confidently replies that he has his own methods, which immediately raises Yuhayan's suspicions, making him wonder if Yujin has awakened. Yuhayan starts bombarding Yujin with questions, asking if his skill helps him identify high class people or awaken them. He also speculates that Yujin must have awakened after meeting with him, as he didn't go through the broker. Moreover, Yuhayan becomes increasingly curious about the nature of Yujin's skill. Realizing that revealing the truth could lead to him being imprisoned forever, our boy quickly downplays his ability, claiming it's an F-class skill that merely predicts whether someone is weak or strong and can only awaken one person per month. Yahayan, after hearing this, concludes that with such a limited skill set, Yujin wouldn't become a major target. He reasons that Yujin's ability will likely become redundant soon as an awakening center is about to be established that can provide a rough estimate of individual's potential. Yuhayan further explains that once the awakening center is fully established, anyone will be able to safely awaken, reducing the number of awakening scams and decreasing the demand for skills like Yujin's. Our boy, recalling that the current time is just before these centers were established, concludes that it's actually beneficial. Since his skill will soon be obsolete, there's no need to worry about being targeted. Confidently, he tells Yohayan that he will find an A-rank hunter, so Yohayan should give him a chance. Yohayan agrees, but warns that it won't be an easy task, then proceeds to move Yujin's belongings to his house. Our boy feels a sense of victory, wondering if Yohayan really thought it would be easy to keep him confined. He silently vows to quickly recruit an A or even S-rank hunter, with a fleeting thought of possibly surpassing the Abyss Guild in the process. The next day, Yujin heads to the Korean Hunter Association's Awakener Registration Office with Songhan by his side. Onlookers murmur with curiosity, speculating that Yujin might be a promising S rank newbie due to his association with Songhan. However, they are visibly disappointed when they learn that Yujin is classified as an F rank. Afterward, our boy decides to purchase some equipment with the hefty sum of $1 million that his brother gave him, 
leaving him to wonder if Yohayan has truly lost his mind. Upon entering the Hunter Association Mall, they are greeted by staff who guide Yujin through various types of stat-enhancing gear. However, our boy finds the items too flashy and asks for something simpler. They present him with the last piece of the Black Fairy's earring. Next, he buys leather gloves that boost his strength and vitality, allowing him to possess the stats of a C-Class. Despite these purchases, Yujin still wants to get a contract and some potions with the remaining money. As our boy exits the mall, Songhen asks where he went. Yujin responds that he was just shopping and wonders if he can't even do that freely. Songhan advises him to inform him whenever he plans to go somewhere, and suggests they head back if Yujin has no other plans. Our boy, however, replies that he has one more stop to make. He recalls that the ice witch, Park, lives nearby, and if his memory serves him right, this could be a significant opportunity. The ice witch, Park, should be living with her relatives who run a barbecue place in Yuido. Yujin believes that Yuhayan should have no objections to Park being his bodyguard, as she is exceptionally talented even among other A-class hunters. He recalls that the ice which awakened three years later, at the age of 18, which means she would still be in middle school at this time. Our boy realizes that he needs to locate Park quickly to recruit her and regain his precious freedom. Once they arrive at the food street, Eugen inquires at every shop about Park Yerim, but none of them seem to know her. With numerous barbecue shops in the area, it appears he may have to visit them all. Eugen asks Songhan if he is hungry, to which Songhan replies that he is not. He questions whether their presence in the area is solely due to the barbecue shops, pointing out that there are plenty around the abyss. Our boy explains that they are here because he sensed a strong presence in this location. Songhan responds by teasing that Yujin is acting like a sect leader. Just as Yujin is about to finish his supper and continue his search for Yerim, he observes someone yelling and realizes it's Park Yerim, who is telling her uncle that it wasn't her fault, but Park Suchin's. Her uncle threatens to beat her, but Yerim flees, urging him to simply die. In that moment, she runs into Yujin. However, before Yujin can stop Yerim, she escapes. Our boy instructs Songhan to take care of his snacks and chases after Yerim, puzzled by her speed despite not having awakened yet. Still, it is not too fast for Yujin's equipment. Our boy runs like the wind to catch up to Yerim. After sprinting for a while, he locates her and asks if she could spare a moment to talk. Yerim, believing that the guy was sent by her uncle, flees from Yujin, unaware that a car is about to hit her. Our boy takes a great leap and manages to grab Yerim just in time, but they fall a little distance due to the momentum. He ensures Yerim's safety as she sits on him, wishing the landing had been cooler. Taken aback by Yujin's strength, Yerim inquires if he is a hunter, but Yujin begs her to first get off of him. It has been quite a long time since Yujin last enjoyed Korean beef, so he is amazed by the marbling to the point that our boy starts to drool. He offers Yerim the opportunity to order as much as she wants, and she happily accepts, eagerly pouncing on the food. This makes our boy feel that it was a good choice to use a corporate card, as he notices that Yerim is genuinely enjoying the meal. However, Yujin then asks if this place is truly suitable for her, considering she mentioned that her uncle also runs a barbecue restaurant where they could have eaten. Yerim quickly tells Yujin that he should not even consider dining at her uncle's restaurant because her uncle is very bad at cooking. She adds that our boy would only be wasting his money there. Curiously, Yerim asks Yujin why someone like him is looking for her, especially since he is the older brother of the Abyss Guild leader. In response, our boy replies that he senses good vibes from her. This comment leads Yerim to believe that he might be from a sect, prompting her to decide to walk out of the restaurant as she is not interested in a sect. Eugen tells Yerim that things are not as they seem, lying to her by saying that he was actually acquainted with her parents, who helped him when his own parents passed away. He explains that he is here to repay her parents for their assistance, and that the reason for his delay is that he has been extremely busy with his life, for which he feels genuinely guilty. Upon hearing this, Yerim accepts Eugen's apology, reassuring him that it is nothing for her as she is aware of many individuals who would backstab her. Our boy, on the other hand, appreciates Yerim's understanding of his situation, which brings him joy. Eugen then tells Yerim that he has been considering ways to help her, and that was when he noticed her extraordinary talent. Surprised, Yerim asks our boy what he means by her having talent. 
Eugen responds that she possesses the potential to awaken, a fact he knows due to a skill he possesses that allows him to assist others in awakening. He confidently asserts that Yerim will awaken as at least a B-rank hunter. Our boy further adds that he would be able to help Yerim become an established hunter, as he has the Abyss Guild backing him. If Yerim has no objections, Eugen would like to become her sponsor. Therefore, he asks her if she would like to sign a contract with him to become a hunter. Yerim is surprised to learn that she can become a hunter, while Eugen wonders if she will accept the offer, considering that hunting is a popular career among young people. However, he believes he should present a more compelling case to persuade her, so he pulls the contract from his inventory and asks Yerim if she would like to read it. Yerim is astonished to see a contract appear seemingly out of nowhere and asks Eugen if this is what is called an inventory. Our boy responds that she will also have access to an inventory once she awakens. He further explains that this contract is unique, as it is made from the byproducts of a dungeon. All Yerim needs to do is officially sign the contract as Park Yerim. Eugen then outlines the conditions of the contract, that Yerim will be contracted to the Abyss Guild. Yerim must keep Han Yujin's skill a secret, while also being responsible for protecting him for a year. However, this last condition surprises Yerim, prompting Yujin to explain that he needs individuals who can safeguard him, as people often attempt to harm our boy despite his status as a weak F rank. Yerim then questions whether Yujin feels embarrassed about being protected by a middle schooler. Yujin reassures her that there is no need to worry because, if Yerim awakens, she will be significantly stronger than he is. What concerns Yerim the most is whether awakening will grant her independence. Our boy responds that it is indeed possible, as everyone who is awakened is treated equally. After hearing this, Yerim picks up the pin and decides to sign the contract, but Yujin stops her, warning that she cannot sign it hastily. He emphasizes the importance of reviewing the contract carefully, as it currently lacks her conditions. Our boy then reveals to Yerim that she could have encountered serious problems if he had wanted to exploit her simply because she was about to sign the contract thoughtlessly. He tells Yerim that she needs to ensure the contract is fair, emphasizing that it is crucial for her to learn this, especially since she is new to the process. Our boy mentions that she will need a guardian to co-sign the contract because she is underage. Yerim then asks what she should do if her guardian is the one exploiting her. However, our boy does not fully grasp her meaning. She adds that a fair contract means nothing if everyone is going to take advantage of her anyway, but our boy still struggles to understand her perspective. Meanwhile, Yerim's uncle enters the restaurant, shouting for her because he heard from someone that she was there. He demands to know why she is wandering around instead of doing what he instructed, insisting that she follow him so he can teach her a lesson today. At this moment, Eugen intervenes, telling Yerim's uncle to calm down. Yerim's uncle then turns to Eugen and asks whether he is in a relationship with Yerim. Eugen responds that it is insane for Yerim's uncle to think such a thing and tightly grips his hand, refusing to let go. This surprises Yerim's uncle, who does not perceive Eugen as particularly strong. However, he finds himself unable to free himself from our boy's grasp. Yerim's uncle orders Eugen to release his hand, asserting that our boy has no business interfering in their family matters. At that moment, Eugen's gaze falls on Yerim, who appears frightened. Our boy finally notices the poor condition in which she lives, with rugged clothing and worn-out shoes that she can barely lace properly. It dawns on Eugen that Yerim was trying to convey that she is better off without a guardian like her uncle. Yerim confirms this, stating that Eugen is correct, as her uncle is entirely evil. He took all the inheritance left to her by her parents, and did not give her a single cent Yerim adds that her uncle only provided her with a cheap umbrella during a storm and failed to buy her a new one after it broke. This leaves Yerim to use a plastic bag while walking around. The patrons in the restaurant are shocked by the unfolding drama and conclude that it is a clear case of abuse. In response, Yerim's uncle, enraged by the embarrassment she has caused him in front of everyone, Yerim's uncle pushes Eugen away, causing him to fall to the ground. Shocked seeing this Yerim quickly asks Eugen if he is alright, 